Hello and welcome, everyone. You are listening to The Crack. This is a little bit different, this one. <laughs> so this is the first draft, or attempt, or pilot, or whatever you'd like to call it, for what I want to do next uh, regarding podcasts. It's not too dissimilar to some of the other episodes I've done on the Crack podcast with the big great man of Ben McDewey and the Rooney McRae episodes, but I'm wanting to make it its own, its own thing. So, um, yeah, take a stab in the dark and see how this goes. It's going to be a bit different, though. Um, I'm going to try not to swear on this. <laughs> it's family friendly, and it's all scripted. Now, I mean, I might come off the script a wee bit, but I'm going to be reading it out. So, basically, guys, basically, basically. I'm releasing it through the crack, as that is my platform I have, and I have amassed some listeners. <laughs> Thank you for listening. So I'm putting this out there as like a... You're my sample audience, if you know what I mean. Now, if you do listen to this, and I sincerely hope you do, I would greatly appreciate any feedback that you can offer afterwards. Constructive, if possible. If you were to just message saying, I don't like it. Okay, that's fair enough, but please tell me why you didn't like it. Even if it's something like you don't like my voice. Okay, just let me know, you know. If you do like it, again, thank you. Please, again, say why, and it will help me greatly. Now, I'll, um, I'll link the contact page to the website under the episode. So, I don't know if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or maybe not Google. I think that's going away soon. I'll put the link below, and if you're listening to it on the YouTube page, if you want to just leave the feedback in the comments below, that would be perfect. Um, but yes, feedback, guys, uh, very much appreciate anything at all, whether you like the pacing, you don't like the pacing, the content itself, anything at all, you want more jokes, you want less history, you want it in two parts, you think it's too long, just genuinely, anything, it all helps, you know. And then from there, I can make changes and polish it all up, and release it officially. But okay. On with the show. Welcome to episode one of Legends of Lore, a podcast about the legends and the lore that are all around us. This first episode is going to be very close to home. I live in Scotland, north, in a place called Inverness. It's not a big place. It's smaller than many places, but it's certainly bigger than the town that I grew up in. And Inverness hasn't always been a city. It used to be a town, but the Queen changed that at the millennium. Bam. Suddenly a city. And as a city, it may be young, but the time before that goes way back. There's plenty of history there. There's plenty of history in the surrounding area. Plenty of local history. It is some of that local history that gives us tonight's episode, Battlefield Ghosts. That's a bit vague. I should say Culloden Battlefield Ghosts. If hauntings are, as some suspect, echoes of past events, an emotional moment imprinted, perhaps by, say, trauma, then by that logic it makes sense that every battlefield should be haunted by something. So if you've tuned into this hoping to hear about ghosts that haunt battlefields of the American Civil War, or fields in England, or even areas that are now farmed by French and Belgique farmers, I am sorry to say that is not the case. At least today. Now before we get into what may be haunting the area, let's talk about why something may be haunting the area. To start off, as obvious as it sounds, the reason that the area is called Culloden Battlefield is because a battle took place there. Not just some random clash of opposing families fighting over who gets to own the strongest bull, or brothers escalating a petty squabble over who gets to marry their prettiest cousin. No. It was the last battle to ever be fought on British soil. The last battle for the Jacobites in the Jacobite Rebellion. It took place on Dramossi Moor, roughly six miles from Inverness, one cold morning. 
Yes, the Battle of Culloden was fought on the 16th of April, 1746. Okay, first of all, let's just get these little bits out of the way. Now, very common misconceptions about the battle is that it was Scotland versus England. That is not the case. It would make it so much more easier if it was, but no. And funnily enough, that is what I was taught when I first learned about it in primary school just over 20 years ago. Another often false claim for the root cause boils down to the sadly still relevant clashing beliefs of the Catholic faith against the Protestant faith. Just like the Scottish versus English, that would be a much simpler, straightforward reason. But likewise, it's not so simple. In fact, both fighting sides on the battlefield that day had Catholic and Protestants among them, as well as Scottish and English. Probably French and Welsh. Blue-eyed people, brown-eyed people, tall folk, short folk, lactose intolerance and left-handed people. There was a complete mixture of people. It wasn't just a chessboard of black and white. And to muddy the facts all the more when it comes to religions on the battlefield that day, saying Catholics and Protestants fought, it wasn't just Protestants under one religious banner. The Protestants don't just get sorted under Protestants. There were Protestant Presbyterians, and there are Protestant Episcopalians too. What's the difference there? Well, Protestant Presbyterians are ruled by elders, nominated by the congregations, and the Episcopalians were churches governed by bishops, most usually appointed by the monarch. It doesn't get any easier or straightforward than this, I'm afraid, but all right. Let's just go ahead and take a step back a bit. The battle, the Battle of Culloden, was a British civil war. And a civil war, if you don't know, don't worry if you don't, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. A civil war is when people from within the same country or state are fighting among themselves. The Battle of Culloden was one of those. It was a civil war. It was fought between supporters of the House of Stuart and the House of Hanover. The House of Stuart had previously held the throne, now... Buckle in, buckaroos. This is going to take a second. Okay, here we go. The House of Stuart was a royal house, a dynasty. Its first monarch, following the death of King David II, was Robert II, whose mother, Marjorie Bruce, was Robert the Bruce's daughter. Marjorie had married Walter Stuart. And when her brother, King David II, died without an heir, the throne went to her son, who, due to his father's surname, was called Stuart. So the surname of the king went from Bruce to Stuart. Robert II was coronated in 1371, whereupon the name Stuart continued down the successive line of Scottish rulers. In 1503, when he was 30, King James IV of Scotland married the 13-year-old Margaret Tudor. And Margaret Tudor, if her surname sounds familiar, was of the House of Tudor from the English throne. Her brother would go on to be King Henry VIII of England, a man who famously had a few wives. The Scottish throne family and the English throne family, they were now joined united through the marriage of James and Margaret. And just a wee side note, when we get to Mary, Queen of Scots, she was raised in France, where they do not commonly use the letter W, W. So the spelling of Stuart went from S-T-E-W-A-R-T to S-T-U-A-R-T, the French way. One hundred years after James Stuart's marriage to Margaret Tudor, Margaret's niece, Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, after 44 years on the English throne, died. And she had no children. No one to pass the crown down to. In the order of succession, it went to the next heir. 
and this was James and Margaret's great-grandson, James Charles Stuart. Now he was already the King of Scotland, he was James the Sixth of Scotland, but due to the two separate crowns, he was also James the First of England and Ireland. Same man, two titles. Depending on where he is, James the Sixth in Scotland, James the First in England and Ireland. Sadly, having one man on the thrones of Scotland, England and Ireland didn't necessarily mean peace and love. Each country had their own governments and church systems. Therefore, conflicts and fighting between the countries simply continued. This period ended up being, as a lot of history was, very violent. James VI, his son Charles I, was king during this time, this period. It is a whole massive chunk of British history known as the War of the Three Kingdoms, or sometimes more simply, the English Civil War. There's nothing simple about it. Charles I was actually executed by the government, not assassinated, but put to trial and decapitated. The crown went to his son, Charles II, who died without an heir. Whereupon, the crown went to his brother, another James, James the Seventh of Scotland, but also James the Second of England and Ireland. Same James, different title, depending on which throne. He had many children. Sadly, not a lot of them survived into adulthood, but remember his son, James, and his daughters, Mary and Anne. Let's just also take a moment and remember, all of the Stuarts have been of the Catholic faith. Apart from Mary and Anne, they were raised Anglican under the instruction of their uncle, King Charles II, who saw the writing on the wall that Catholicism was becoming unpopular. Okay, now James the Seventh's daughter, Mary, she married a Dutch prince named William of Orange. Orange was an area in what is now the south of France. He, William of Orange, was of Protestant faith. Have you ever heard of an orange walk? They're not named after the colour. James the Seventh's time on the throne was not without issue. He was fond of unchecked power, absolutism. He had members of the Church of England prosecuted for printing materials he didn't like. And by the way, I cannot stress this enough, this is a very simplistic, dumbed down version. The history behind it all is incredibly complex and weaving. But essentially, the aftermath brought on a sense that keeping him on the throne would cause another English civil war. So the political leaders invited, invited, William of Orange to come over and assume the throne. He arrived with his army and James vacated the position. He went to France. <laughs> he got to France. The throne was now under William and Mary. Mary died first, and following William's death, the duty to reign fell back upon Mary's sister, Anne. This was in 1707. However, in 1701, a thing called the Act of Settlement had been passed by the English Parliament that had made it so that only Protestants could succeed to the crown of England and Ireland, no Catholics, meaning that whoever was on the throne wouldn't have to do as the Pope said. And then Queen Anne died in 1714. Due to the act of settlement, with no Catholic to take the throne, her second cousin became the next in line, George I. He came from the House of Hanover, known as the Hanoverians. The House of Hanover was now on the throne. Remembering King James VII of Scotland, but also King James II of England, his son was also called James Stuart. That was Mary and Anne's brother. And he, the, the son, James Stuart, was the Prince of Wales at the time when his father lost the throne. Then he vacated and went to France. Prince of Wales back then, same as today, was the title given to the next heir apparent to the throne. So the next in line. Whoever is the Prince of Wales is due to next be the king. And this James Stuart, son of King James the Seventh, he himself had a son, a son called Charles Edward Stuart, who apparently was quite a feminine looking pretty wee thing. He got the name Bonnie Prince Charlie. 
and it was Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, who led the Jacobites at Culloden. In case you're asking, led the Jacobites, who are these Jacobites? You what? The name James in Latin is Jacobus. Jacobite means follower of James, and as we just learned, there was no shortage of the use of the name James. Jacobites didn't support the Stuarts leaving the throne. They followed James. A rebellion had grown and gathered steam. They had amassed followers from different parts of the United Kingdom and some from France. But the Jacobite army could be divided into three classes. The first and the largest was the clan system. Men of a clan who had to fight due to their chieftain's orders. They fought in clan regiments. And what's a clan, you ask? Well, clan, spelled C. L-A-N-N, Charlie, Lima, Ava, November, November, is a Gallic word. Translates to children. Clans essentially are an extended family group based off of sharing a common ancestor. That is an easy way of putting it, but not strictly the rule. Clans were also built due to geography. Forcible assimilation during clan expansion or territory, or maybe families were invited to join through an offering. The promise of regular food or a bit of land. A clan is like a large group, a gang, sort of like a tribe, led by chieftains. So the first and largest class of the Jacobite army was the clans. The second were those that were under military service due to the lairds of the land that they lived on. Many of these men were there under protest, but pride and the threat of their homes being burned caused them to go. The third class volunteers. These could have been people who supported the Catholic crown, or people who hated the reigning crown for any reason. Adventure seekers. Or just lunatics. Many battles and clashes had occurred with Jacobite rebellions, but it ended at Culloden, the area of which is described in Black's picturesque tourist of Scotland as being as grim and shelterless a waste as vengeance could desire. For an enemy's grave. The House of Hanover, they reigned. They were the family on the throne at the time and they very much intended to keep it that way. They were led to a victorious outcome at Culloden by Prince William Augustus. He was known as the Duke of Cumberland. He was the third and youngest son of King George the Second. And King George the Second, the Duke of Cumberland's dad, is the great 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 great-great-great-great-great-grandfather to the current British monarch, King Charles III. And if you weren't counting, that's eight greats. But there's direct lineage. With his dad being the king, you'd be safe to assume, and go ahead, assume, the Duke of Cumberland's men were fighting for the crown. They were fighting for the government. They were the official army, so to speak, compared to the Jacobites, who were the rebellion army. The British army, the ones under the Duke of Cumberland's command, were well trained, they were well equipped, they were well fed, and they were better dressed. They were clad in red coats, that's why they get called the Red Coats. Now when I say well equipped, I don't just mean they had fancier hats than the Jacobites. I mean they did, but that's not the point. These soldiers, the Red Coats, each soldier had enough powder, ball and paper on them for 24 rounds. 24 rounds may not seem like a terrific amount of firepower for a soldier to have at his disposal, but this is the second half of the 1700s. The guns in the battlefield are not worth comparing to the guns used today. The guns they used were called muskets. They operated with a mechanism called flintlock. The way a flintlock gun worked can be explained in quite a straightforward manner, but I won't pretend that I could have come up with it. Okay, so imagine that you've got a hollow tube that's been blocked at one end. If you pour some explosive powder into that tube and then ignite it, the pressure is going to force upward and out of the tube. That's the only way the force can go. If you put something on top of the powder before you ignite it, when it does ignite, it's going to push that something up and out of the tube. That's basically how the flintlock guns work. The soldiers would pour gunpowder, a combustible explosive powder, down the barrel, a long narrow tube blocked off at the end, before they dropped a small ball made of lead down the barrel too. They would use a long narrow piece of metal, a ramrod, that was flattened at the end to press a little piece of fabric against the lead ball and to properly crush it down. 
crush it as compact as can be. A small hammer device, down level with where the compacted powder and lead ball was, was attached to a trigger mechanism. When the trigger was pulled, the hammer would strike down. A little piece of flint was fixed to it. This would generate a spark, and... Vavavoom! The gunpowder ignites. The force of the explosion forces the lead ball out the barrel at such a rate that it's going to go into whoever is in its way. A grisly detail, and who doesn't love a grisly detail, is that the wee lead balls weren't always completely solid. Being hit by one and not being killed immediately didn't mean you'd survived. Bits of the lead ball could break off inside. Lead poisoning and general infections could follow in the days, weeks and months following the injury. That's what the Redcoats were trained to fire in strict discipline. A soldier had to be able to fire a shot every 18 to 20 seconds. That includes the pouring of powder, getting the ball, ramrodding it down, lining up the shot, and boam. Don't get me wrong, the Jacobites had muskets too. Not every soldier would have had one though, and they wouldn't have been as well trained, nor would the weapons have been as well maintained. Now rifles are obviously used over a short distance, a little range to them. And the redcoats, for when their enemy had got too close to be shot at, had bayonets to pop onto the end of their muskets, 16 inches long and sharpened the entire length. These were for hand-to-hand -hand intense, see the whites of your enemy's eyes combat, and 16 inches, that's almost a foot and a half in length. But they were necessary. The Jacobites preferred and tried and tested method, their battle technique, if you will, was to make a serious amount of noise, hooting and hollering, screaming and roaring, banging weapons together. And on top of all that, clans had dedicated pipers, bagpipers, to play pibrochs. Pibrochs are long, droning, morose musical pieces. They, the Jacobites, would stand in their massed rows opposite the enemy. They'd make their noise, and then they'd move. But not move like left, right, left, right, left, in a, in a military march style. No, they would start with a just moving forward, walking. A fast walk, but moving forward. And then quicken the pace. A walk, to a trot, to a jog, to a run, to a sprint. Hundreds of men running full pelt together on the solid hillside or basin of a glen. The enemies would stand, hearing the thunder get closer and feeling the ground beneath them actually shake, rumbling. And when they came into view, it wouldn't have been a pretty sight. Not a sight that would calm them, anyway. Men wrapped in massive tartan outfits. Kilts, yes, but not a kilt like the modern formal garb you'll see a Scotsman wear to a wedding these days. Large, engulfing, baggy, darkly dyed kilts, rarely taken off, likely only cleaned when the wearer wore it while he walked through water. How many W's were there? All the alliteration today. Under the tartan, a dirty shirt. In those days, a white shirt wouldn't stay white for very long. And then there's the man's appearance. Unshaven, unkempt, lacking the discipline of the government army. He would have been showing signs of sleeping rough. And likely, very unlikely, he would have been unwashed. <laughs> they would come charging, brandishing their weapons. A long broadsword not for delicate fencing against an opponent, rather for swinging and slashing to do as much damage as possible. They carried that in their right hand, the broadsword. Their left forearm was covered with a shield called a targe, small and ornate, wooden, but covered in brown leather and decorated with studs. Their left hand clutched a dirk, a dagger. Helpful for finishing a man off if you found your broadsword was wedged between a few of his ribs. Quick dirk through the throat, and there you have it. Alive no more. 
Hopefully that's painted quite the illustrative picture in your mind for you there. Where do we go from here? Now, you know what they were fighting with, and you know their fighting styles. Let's just briefly talk about the night before the battle. April 15th, 1746. Both sides knew that a battle was happening the next day, and they both knew where. Dromossi Moor, about six miles from Venice. The Jacobites had marched up, they were tired and they were hungry, exhausted and starved. They settled on the moor, soon to be battlefield, and to many of them the place where they would die. It was a cold night and the men waited for their dinner. The supplies for which were in Inverness, but no one had made the actual arrangements for it to be transported out to where they were. The only ration they were fed, albeit not a ration that every man received, was a single biscuit. Adding all the more insult to that is that many had declined payment for their involvement and instead opted to just be fed a meal. As they settled in for a cold night, rumour goes that Bonnie Prince Charlie wasn't hungry and shivering there among his men on the moor, but rather found himself being wined and dined in the cosy setting that was Culloden House. Culloden House is still there today. Well, there's a building there called Glodden House. It's not the same building Bonimus Charlie would have had his Coca Pops in on the morning of the battle before making his way up to the moor. No, the building that is there now was built 34 years later, 1780. And there was more rebuilding in 1947 after a large chunk of it was destroyed beyond repair in a fire. Same spot, different building. With the Bonnie Prince cosy, safe, fed, and merry, the Jacobites were left to wait on the soon-to-be battlefield under the command of their officers. And it was under the command of these officers, one named directly in a source I read, uh, Mr. Lord George Murray. Now remember his name, Lord George Murray. We're going to talk about him some more later on. But it was under his command, and due to his ego, despite protests and reasoning that it was not a good idea, that the Jacobites set off at night for the town of Nairn to the east. And why were they going to Nairn in the dead of night? It wasn't for fishing ships by the beach. The Jacobites were at Culloden by the Redcoats. They were camping at Nairn. Not camping like took some fishing rods and were telling ghost stories under a wee fire. No, they were there as the army. Army camp. But the main reason to make the journey and to attack them that night was because they'd been celebrating. April the 15th, that was also the Duke of Cumberland's birthday. He turned 25 years old that day. And to celebrate, the men were supplied with barrels of brandy and ale. They were fed cheeses and biscuits along with meats. Sounds good. The Jacobite officer's logic was, if the army is cutting loose a little bit, letting their guard down, so to speak, and likely a little bit drunk, why wouldn't you take the opportunity to strike and cut their numbers drastically? Makes sense. The Jacobites set off, the long march began. Now today you can make the journey from the battlefield to Nairn. You leave the car park and follow the road, the B9006, eastward. You'll pass wee clusters of houses, Brookfield being one of them. And keep going and going and going. By the time you reach a little place called Cleffenton, you're parallel to the river. But keep going on that road. Not right to Codder, or left back down to the 96. Straight on. You'll reach Nairn. You'll come in by the sawmill. Simple as that. Huh? Well, that's if you make the journey today. Back in 1746, it was a little bit different. No tarred roads, no street lights at little intervals, no Google Maps. The army marched their way to Nairn as quickly as they could in the dark, with their empty bellies, and they lost their way a few times. However, they did manage to get back on track, and apparently came within view of the Redcoats camp, but unfortunately, they heard the drums summoning the soldiers up for the morning. The Redcoats left Nairn to march to the battlefield just after 5am, so we know it was shy of 5am when they heard the drums. No surprise attack. Instead, a hasty retreat, as fast as they could possibly manage, right back to the moor. So now they were frustrated with their failed surprise endeavour, unrested, unwashed, unfed, 
unhappy. Many of the different materials I was reading about this mentioned that men started to drift off and disappear in the search for food, as is to be expected. If you're going to ask a man to kill for you, and perhaps even die for your cause, you can at least give him some breakfast. They stood in the cold air. Sleet fell down on them. They just waited. And eventually, the Redcoats arrived. They were organised and well equipped. And everyone took their positions. Different accounts have different times for exactly when the battle began. I don't imagine there was an agreed kick-off time, but the armies faced each other. Some say noon, some say one o'clock, but around the afternoon on April the 16th, apparently the Jacobites fired the first cannon. In hindsight, a big mistake. Unfortunately for the Jacobites, by firing a cannon at the Redcoats, the Redcoats felt compelled to return the gesture. They rained down a barrage of cannonballs and musket volleys. When the battle began, the amount of smoke from the cannons was so vast and thick that the volley of musket balls fired through it could be seen almost perfectly. As I said, the Redcoats' cannons fired continuously, during which time the limited Jacobite soldiers with muskets fired back and disciplined, missing the Redcoats, seemingly aiming at the Duke of Cumberland. Now I know what you're thinking. But surely the Jacobites didn't just stand there and let the musket shots and cannonballs just fire straight into the linings of men. I like your thinking, but that is unbelievably exactly what they did. Lack of competent leadership had the men standing there taking the shots, and when a man fell, the officers would order the men to fill the gap. Which is exactly as it sounds. A gap would appear because some poor soldier had just taken either a lead ball or a cannonball, or maybe both. The man fell. His place was vacant, so someone would be sent in to fill the gap. Easy work for the Redcoats. All they had to do was find a line to shoot and just keep firing. The enemies would be putting themselves in the spot. It's ridiculous. Within nine minutes, either eliminated or out of ammo, the Jacobites' artillery fired no more. Now, do you remember earlier how I described the Highland Charge, the shouting and charging, <laughs> how the ground would shake? No order was given for some time for the Jacobites to do that. Most of the deaths in the battle happened at the start due to the cannons, but eventually, after nearly half an hour of cannon fire and musket volley, the Jacobites did do their Highland Charge. By this point, some of the clan regiments had lost nearly a third of their men but the mood itself made for a very poor ground to do the charge on. Heading straight into musket fire and cannonballs, the Jacobites put forward their effort and ran into the smoke. But the ground was soft, marshy. It was moorland, not solid ground. The Redcoats continued to fire as the Jacobites charged. So many Jacobites fell that the ones at the back ended up charging over their wounded and dead comrades. They eventually reached the Redcoats. A Redcoat survivor, a veteran to the battle, wrote a letter to his wife the next day and described the Jacobites' charge as They came running upon our front line like troops of hungry wolves. And then the hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face brawling began. The Jacobites' weapon was the broadsword. It needed to be used up close. A violent, intense, brutal brawl. The Redcoats reportedly had another advantage. On top of being better equipped, better trained, in better numbers, and let's not forget fully fed and rested, their other advantage was a new technique in which they took their bayonet, the stabbing device at the end of the musket, and instead of jabbing forward at the immediate enemy, they would pivot slightly and stab to their right. Not their immediate right. I don't mean that the Redcoats were standing on the line just bayoneting their comrades. When the Jacobites would attack, they would lift their swords to swing it down and hopefully do as much damage as possible in the arc. Swing attack. Ideally, if they could open a man from below his neck and all the way down his torso, possibly even spill his guts out, ideal. 
big violent attacks and one swing. That's energy efficient. So when the redcoats were all lined up and the Jacobite stood in front of them and he lifted his right arm with the full intent to do damage, he was leaving his right side exposed. Jabbing forward directly at the man in front of you meant you were probably going to clip your bayonet off the metal studs on his targe, or even worse, get it stuck. Then you're attached to the man who is about to slice and dice you. To get around it, or to actually combat it, the redcoats would focus their attention to the enemy ahead and to the right of them, one over. Instead of sticking your bayonet out straight forward, you could do it diagonally. Get the man on his exposed side. Maybe puncture a lung, if you were lucky. Then again, 16 inches, that's going to basically go right through him. Puncture both lungs and skewer his heart. Yikes. Whether or not your adrenaline and instinct would allow you the discipline to actually manage that in battle is up for debate. And it would have taken a tremendous amount of trust in the guy to your left. Look at the person to your left now. Would you trust them to be in a, a Jacobite who is about to cleaver you? Hmm? Well, with the Battle of Culloden now in full bloody violent swing, it didn't take all too long for the Jacobites to meet defeat. A redcoat, a fusilier by the name of Lynn, was quoted as saying, once the smoke lifted from the centre of the moor, I never saw a field thicker of dead. Another account describes the aftermath as The heather before them breathed and heaved, and the air was full of the cries and the groans of the wounded. Where the fallen were thickest, the bodies made little pyramids, from which naked arms or legs jerked in agony, and the red and yellow of the tartans were mixed with the blood and bile of the clans. The redcoats were victorious. Bonnie Prince Charlie fled and got away. More than 300 Jacobites who had fled from the battle were captured soon after and arrested. They got brought back to Inverness. Although the totals, by the end of the whole affair, had it as around 3,500 Jacobites had been taken prisoner, 200 of those were executed or died in prison. Around 1,000 of them got shipped off to the colonies, essentially forced labour as a prison sentence. More than 200 were banished, I didn't know where to, and mysteriously, the fate of 700 more is unknown. Now the aftermath of the battle, this was now when the Duke of Cumberland earned his nickname of the Bloody Butcher. Redcoats police the Highlands, or as it was named, to pacify the Highlands. John Pebble writes, in his book, Culloden. So Cumberland set about bringing the Highlands to heel in the manner he thought best. In every town, at tuck of drum, his orders were read, demanding the submitting of all arms under penalty of hanging, demanding the laying of information against hidden rebels under penalty of hanging, demanding the surrender of the young pretender under penalty of hanging. The young pretender being Bonnie Prince Charlie. Pretender because pretending to be the rightful heir to the throne. In every town every morning, people were reminded that a hanging could be their fate if they didn't obey. And say what you want about the Duke of Cumberland. He seems to have been a bit ahead when it came to equality. It didn't matter, man or woman, young or old. He would have them hanged. In fact, before he even won a Culloden, the night before in Nairn, he had ordered the hanging of a 17-year-old boy who had been accused of spying for the Jacobites. The boy had been cut down after a minister from Nairn had appealed for the mercy of the young man, and apparently the boy did live. He had some blood let and regained consciousness. Yes, the Redcoats, they terrorised the population. For the next few months following the battle, they wandered from village to town, to croft, to settlement, to fishing bay, to ferry ports, all around the highlands. They would plunder and loot the homes they came across. They often burnt the homes too, and this was 
regardless of whether the man of the house has fought for the Jacobites. The Redcoats were, in a word, bullies. Many of the people living in the Highlands at that time spoke Gaelic and not English, so they couldn't surrender or explain or plead to the attackers, the rapists, the arsonists, the thieves. The people of the land were forced to take an oath of loyalty in English. And the oath goes, I do swear, as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment, I have not, nor shall have, in my possession, any gun, sword, pistol, or arm whatsoever, and never use tartan, plaid, or any part of the highland garb. And if I do so, may I be cursed in my undertakings, family, and property, may I be killed in battle as a coward, and lie without burial, in a strange land far from the graves of my forefathers and kindred. May all this come across me, if I break my oath. The clampdown on the Highland way of life was truly at its end. With language, clothing and ownership of what could arguably be tools, the people struggled. The Redcoats stole all the livestock they could find and sold it to buyers in lowland Scotland and England, this was an attempt to starve the widows and fatherless children off the land. Some were seen to lick the blood off the ground, where the animals had been butchered for the soldiers. Now, not all soldiers were completely heartless, and some gave some food to the starved natives, usually traded for a brooch or a shoe buckle. However, once the Duke of Cumberland found out that some soldiers were feeding the women and children, he brought that to an end. A warning was put out that read, there is no meal to be sold to any person but soldiers. Their wives are not allowed to buy it. If any soldier, soldier's wife, or any other person belonging to the army is known to sell or give any meal to any Highlanders or person of the country, he shall be first whipped severely for disobeying this order, and then put on mean and water in the provost for a fortnight. Food became scarce. People became desperate. Now we shan't venture into the Highland clearances, as I do believe they deserve an episode all to their own, but needless to say, whatever side of history you may find yourself rooting for, the defeat, and ultimately the ending, of the Jacobites at Culloden brought change that cannot be measured. Going over everything that happened on the day, the violence, the emotion, the, the death and the events that were part of the fallout. If you find yourself believing in ghosts and ask yourself for a moment, do you think the area could be haunted? The answer certainly has to be yes. Interestingly, in what I read in the preparation for this, yes, it's preparation, this isn't all off the top of my head, I couldn't find a point where folks started to mention the possibility of a haunting. I did find a little bit of information explaining that the graves in the battlefield, there's mass, well there was mass graves, just down from where the government troops were placed, but within 20 years, due to souvenir hunters, grave robbers and just gross people, all the bones were gone. Stolen. That's pretty weird. Don't be stealing bones out of a grave. Not unless you're a museum. Preserve them. Like a tasty gherkin. Don't sell them like some top of the range Ford Mondeo. No bones in the graves, but spooky goings on. Oh yeah. That happened the night before the battle. But I'll tell you about that just in a moment. But haunting itself, there's there's no start date to the hauntings. Hauntings. You would think I would start off by talking about ghosts, but let's jazz it up a little bit. The closest haunting, if you like, comes from the evening before the battle, April the 15th, 1746. Bonnie Prince Charlie sits down to his dinner at Culloden House and the Duke of Cumberland celebrates his birthday. As the Jacobite soldiers sit on the moor and wait to see if any food will arrive, one of the officers, Lord George Murray, 
from earlier on, remember? Lord George Murray reportedly saw a harpy type creature. A harpy comes from Greek mythology, and it is said to be a being with the head of a human and the body of a bird. He saw it above his men, soaring high above the would-be battlefield before disappearing. Was it there? Who knows? The records for it have it only as himself being the one to witness it. But then again, if he was as sensible a man as he is proclaimed to be, then maybe having your officer, who you're expected to literally follow, into battle. Having him come up to you the evening before the battle, and asking, Hey, did any of you guys see that massive omen of death appear before us? Maybe that wouldn't have been the wisest of things to bring to his men's attention. Not too great for morale, if, uh, if your head honcho thinks he's seeing physical omens of death looming over you. Now, it could be argued, and it could be argued very fairly, that the thing, whatever it was, that Lord George Murray believed he saw the evening before the battle, the horrifying omen of death, could have simply been a hallucination brought on maybe by a form of post-traumatic stress. Or even perhaps his eyesight wasn't the best, and there was no spec savers or Vision Express about back then for him to drop in for his yearly NHS eye checkup. Maybe he saw a bird or something physically blowing around, and his eyes just weren't up to the task of identifying it. Maybe, maybe. But what's this? I'm going to read directly a passage from the book Culloden Tales by Hugh Allison. The following occurred in the early 1990s. This is a tour guide's recollection of what happened. There was a full moon as we walked across the moor, and just a hint of mist starting to form. Although the evening was cold, it was blessed by that winter's edge that makes you glad to be out. So we paused at the stone inscribed, The Field of the English. I was looking down the government lines when I saw it. I drew the attention of the others to what looked like a large, black, broken umbrella straddling the path, close to the yellow flag. Imagine our surprise, therefore, when it stretched itself and arose from the ground, looking like nothing quite so much as a giant black bat. It creaked its way into the sky, although not far, and then, after hanging there for seconds, it disappeared. It didn't fly away, it just disappeared, vanishing before our eyes, like the picture on an old TV, fit into a flat line, then gone. Well, what do you think of that? Did the tour guide see the same creature as Lord George Murray, hundreds of years apart? Was that some kind of omen of death lurking around the battlefield? Maybe some rare toadstools released a hallucinogenic spore and the folks were all tripping. All they saw was a duck going through a goth phase. <laughs> Interesting. The battlefield is, of course, home to most of the hauntings and unexplained ongoings there. There are some a bit further afield, but we'll get to them later. Okay, so the, the battlefield itself... Now at this point I'm going to be straight up with you and say that I walk the dog here, I would say at least three nights a week. And that's not slang for anything, I, I quite literally drive up to the little car park, get out, and do a route around the battlefield, with my four-legged companion getting a good sniff around and as many toilet breaks as she needs. And don't worry, I always pick up what she leaves. Very often, like the majority of the time, I'm the only one up there. And I have never seen anything, or heard anything, or felt anything, as much as I would like to. The spookiest thing that happens there that I've seen is the amount of people who go to the grave marker for the clan that the character in Outlander is from. Which is fictional, guys. And they've actually worn down the ground around it to the point that it was fenced off to give the, gra <laughs> to give the grass a chance to grow back to normal. And I don't imagine that the National Trust of Scotland minds too much because there's good money in tourists. But without getting all ranty and going way off topic, mainly because I have no proof, I've only been told apparently there's a coffee kiosk 
that they wheel out in the summer onto the battlefield <laughs> so that visitors can grab a cappuccino in the sunshine while they take a moment to consider the dead and then eat a wee slice of shortbread. Next thing you know, they'll have a hot dog cart and you can visit the graves after you pick up some chips, cheese and gravy. Hopefully not, that'll be scarier than it goes. Plenty of mention of what I haven't seen on the battlefield, but what about what other people have seen? One of the more common examples of a haunting seen on the battlefield is that of a tall man. A gaunt figure, reportedly adorned in Highland dress, he is said to wander the battlefield, a lost vacant expression on his face. Now it's hard to get lost up there because it's a good path system. Regardless, those who approach him hear him mutter the word defeated to himself. A bit dramatic, I must say. Interestingly, is the idea that this man can be approached. Most folks I know wouldn't go out of their way to approach a walker. Certainly, if you're going to walk past them, you'll give the smile or raised eyebrows and hi. But to make a beeline and listen to what a gaunt lone walker is mumbling to himself, that's strange. And as frequently as the story popped up in my research for this episode, no one seems to take credit for it. Yeah, I saw him. I heard him talking. It's, it's very much an urban legend territory. The examples were always a friend of a friend's parent type stuff, you know. A story I found interesting that does have a person who takes credit took place on the anniversary of the battle. The gentleman lived nearby, walking distance, and after midnight, so very early into the morning hours of April the 16th, he was still up and took his dog for a walk on the moor. As he walked, he saw in the distance what seemed to be little glows of small campfires. Odd, but not unnatural. He would approach in the direction, only for them to extinguish and fade. When he looked around, there would be more in the distance. Was he seeing the afterglow of a Jacobite's campfire as he eternally waited for the dreaded dawn before the battle? Or maybe he was later diagnosed with retinal detachment and migraines. I didn't ask. The anniversary of the battle is a funny one. Many of the sources I read mention the anniversary, with sights and sounds to be expected. A replay of the battle, the scent of musket fire in the air, ghostly spectres seen marching to their doom. I went up there on the eve of the anniversary at night, and the morning of the anniversary itself. I didn't get much sleep, to be honest. I was up there around 11 o'clock in the evening, and then back out there again just before 7. A very often uttered remark about the ambience up at the battlefield is oh you know there's a oh yeah there's yeah, the air just yeah. you know the birds don't even sing up there no birds sing yeah they feel it too well ladies and gentlemen on the anniversary of the battle 2024 the birds were singing the sun was shining it was a beautiful day like I said I was up there just before 7 and I wanted to arrive before folks in costumes showed up, or people start playing bagpipes, and what have you. I recorded both visits, because I had the intention of making this podcast. Nothing eventful happened, but I've trimmed them back, and I'll play you a few seconds. So this first one, this is from the morning of the anniversary. Nothing, no spooky vibes, nothing at all, nothing, nothing unsettling. It's that, honestly, it's a beautiful spring day here, it's fresh, the sun's coming down. Blue skies, birds are singing. So when I was there, it was just a very pleasant morning with dog walkers and joggers. Did I see a ghost? No. Did I have a lovely time? Most certainly. What made it nicer was once I left, I went and got a breakfast roll and a coffee. The night before, that was a slightly different affair. That was a little bit more tense. I arrived late, and it was of course dark, it was myself and the dog. It was cold, and it was windy, and it just wasn't nice. It was pretty spooky. To be 11. Oh, there's no one about. I can see something tall in the distance, but I think that's the, I think, I think that's the bus stop. Uh, just a bit windy, cold, no rain, just cold. It's the sounds of my own footsteps in the path, moving on. 
I'm going closer to the battlefield now. Oh, the wee dog sneezed, bless you. Oh, the wee dog, she's not reacting to anything. That's me at the cottage. Ahead, open battlefield. There's a light in the far distance, but that's not even on the field. That's, that is a way, it's probably a gamekeeper or something. So now we're walking up the incline towards the roof of the visitor centre. It's starting to rain, sort of spitting, sleety, cold, unpleasant. There's something there, but I guess a bunny rabbit, so I'm going to tell myself it's a bunny rabbit. More white movement to my left, but the speed and height, I think it was an animal. To my right, I can see the whole battlefield. Oh, it's that chica. Alright, she's wanting to get out here, so we're going back down the incline. Look back at the battlefield, nothing at all, no sounds. What do you keep looking back at? The wee dog keeps looking back at something. Now, the scariest, if you want to use that word, I will, because I got goosebumps at the time. The scariest thing that happened that night was to do with the dog. We go back to the car, and I started to take off my little lapel clip microphone thing and wind the wire back up. Check the recording was saved, you know, that type of thing. The dog I was with, she was sitting on the passenger seat and looking at the window. Then she started to bark. I got a fright at first just by how loud and sudden it was. But I had a look out the window and there was nothing there. Nothing I could see, anyway. So I told her to shh and gave her a head pat then resumed what I was doing. And she started barking again. I looked again, but there was still nothing there. What did she see that made her bark? Hmm? Something otherworldly? Or maybe a bunny? A strange phenomenon, or a haunting, I don't know what to label it, that popped up when I was researching this that made me recall something I'd heard a little while ago. I was at the local theatre with a friend watching a stage version of a paranormal themed podcast that had been developed into a TV show. Truthfully, I'd never heard of it, but I was invited, so I went and I had a good time. Got some scares and some laughs. It was a decent show. At the end, one of the hosts started talking about local hauntings. And of course, Culloden Battlefield was mentioned. She spoke about the figure walking the moor, defeated. And then about how the birds don't sing. Yeah. Once they'd said their piece, they offered the room an opportunity to share any ghost stories. One of the audience members, a man who actually went to college during the same time I did, raised his hand and got the opportunity to share. He told about how his neighbour was a reenactor. One of the guys who would go along in costumes, authentic to the period, and recreate what they believed to have happened. Now don't laugh at these folks, they're putting their energy into what they love to do. And I wish I had something I was that passionate about. And besides, these reenactors, is that any different than dressing up like your favourite football player? And watching the game. Anyway, the story... The story wasn't that the reenactor had ever seen a figure muttering defeated, or that he'd seen an omen of death flying in the sky. It was that some rocks had disappeared. It doesn't get more dramatic than that. I'm not going to go on and tell you that they disappeared behind what appeared to be redcoats. No. Just, the men had been up there doing their reenactment thing and had left some equipment in bags, but they left them by some rocks so they'd be sure to find that game when they got back. They went away and they had a few cans. Then when they came back, their stuff was still there. But the rocks were gone. So had an opportunistic thief come along and seen his opportunity but in all of his excitement had he accidentally taken the rocks instead of the expensive props. You can't rule out that possibility. Understandably, you may be thinking now, so some drunk guys claimed a rock went missing. Yes. However, once again, Hugh Allison's book, Culloden Tales, has a story in it. There's many stories in it, but this one is relevant at this moment. It tells the story of one of the guides from the visitor centre poking around at the battlefield and finding an old stone. 
two and a half to three foot high, much like in the style of the grave marker stones near the old cairn. Unlike the gravestones, there was no marker or plaque on the stone. Curiously, the stone had trackways where the repeated footfalls of visitors to it had left their mark. The guide and the person he was with were unfamiliar with it, so they left to find someone who may know more about it, but when they got back, the stone was gone, as were the tracks in the grass. The guide never saw the stone again. So did the stone die in the battle and reappear to complete its unfinished work? That wouldn't be where my immediate explanation compass points, but maybe. Interestingly though, if, if you visit Culloden Battlefield and go to visit the gravestones, these stones, the ones with the clan names on them, they were put there 135 years after the battle. They weren't there at the time. You know, <laughs> the guys clearing up weren't like, where should we put these corpses? Not oh, wonderful luck, look at the gravestones. No, no, they were, obviously they were placed there with the intention of being grave markers, but that was nearly 150 years after the incident. So that makes you wonder, if there is some supernatural force up there, why is it moving stones about? Alright now, omens of death, uh, wandering highlanders and vanishing stones. What about people hearing things? Now, sounds are tricky things. A lot of science, and science I cannot even begin to explain, goes into sounds and hearing things. For instance, as I record this, I am sitting at a desk in front of a window. Apparently I'm meant to record podcasts near glass, but I make do with what I have. When that window is open, I can hear sounds from the very bottom of the car park outside of my flat. I can't make out conversations or anything, but if folks are talking, the mumble seems to echo or carry all the way up here. My point here is that with the door to this room closed and the window open, on a completely still night, it can sound like there's muffled voices conversing in this room if you listen from outside of it. And how easy would that be to blame on a ghost? It's all acoustics. I hope. <laughs> the first example of a spooky noise up at the battlefield was told to me a few years ago by a good friend of mine. It's a very brief, quick story. It's about his stepdad. His stepdad had some time to kill in the area, so walked out to the battlefield and became aware of his return time, so quickly turned back and made for a quick retreat. To get back even sooner, he had to pick my friend up from the cinema, if I remember correctly, he cut across the moor off of the path and trekked on. The uneven ground briefly got the better of him. And he snagged his foot. He went down. Badumph. When he hit the ground, he heard someone shout behind him, close to his ear, Get up, man! Or... Keep moving, something to that effect. Of course, there was no one there. He got up, brushed himself off and got on with his life. Did a ghost army officer see a man go down and command from the great beyond? Or was it a voice carried over the vast open land that the wind carried at just the perfect time? Another example of supernatural sounds happened back in 1963. 60 years ago now. This is another tale from Mr. Allison's book. The story goes, A man visited the battlefield and went into the visitor centre. He requested information regarding where the old road went back before the realignment in 1984. The reason he was wondering was because in 1963, he and a lady friend took a drive out to the battlefield at around half past ten at night. They parked by the clan graves and sat in the vehicle having a smoke. As they sat there, with the engine off and the windows open, they began to hear some sounds. Sounds of horses' hoofs, clip-clopping, of horses neighing. 
of the sounds of men marching and mumbling chatter as they went along. The smoking visitor and his female companion, they didn't see anything. It was all sounds. The volume increased. And then, just like something from a horror film, when they couldn't take any more and wanted to get out of there, he turned the key to start the engine so to make their quick getaway. But nothing happened. No turning of the engine. No electronics in the vehicle. No lights or sounds. Nothing. It was only once the sounds outside stopped did the vehicle start, and they made their way. Curiously, the sounds of a final march we played are not just confined exactly to the battlefield itself. I think this is my favourite story out of all of them. Now, remember earlier about how the night before the battle, the Jacobites had attempted an unsuccessful night march. Well, they hadn't attempted an unsuccessful one. Their, their attempt was unsuccessful. Now, th this story comes from the month of June, the year 2006, and it goes like this. Two ladies approached the front desk in the Culloden Battlefield Visitor Centre. They were wondering if any information was available about the route that had been taken by the Jacobites the evening before the battle, the night march to Nairn. They were shown a map and compared the journey to the modern roads today. The ladies pointed to a spot on the map, the spot where their house is at Cleffenton, a hamlet along the route. They were told that if the house had been standing there in 1746, the occupants would have certainly seen the scores of Jacobites passing by the evening before the battle. The ladies agreed, because they still hear them. Five times in the last ten years, the ladies had experienced the same occurrence. They had been woken in the very early hours of the morning by the sounds of large numbers of soldiers making their way along the road, followed by a few moments of silence, and then what sounds like someone rushing to catch up. But when they look out, there is never anything to be seen. Nothing there but a heightened sense of electricity in the air. What was going on there, then? Sound carrying from far away? Likely not. Not if it's happening repeatedly. Well, five times in ten years. Not exactly often, but more than once, certainly. Extremely likely not to be pranksters, as the occupants of the house looked out the window to see what was making the noise, but saw nothing. Unless the neighbours are playing some very long game prank. Which, as much as I would love for this to be something paranormal at work, I think that would be fantastic. The old couple next door are checking their calendars to make sure it's the right time and then playing the tape. We'll get them to move. All right, now, the, the last one to put forward to you, the last one to put forward to you tonight, isn't near the battlefield. It isn't on the road to Nairn. It isn't even in the location that was there when the battle took place. Culloden House. We mentioned it earlier. Where Bonnie Prince Charlie stayed the night before the battle. Remember it was rebuilt. The building isn't there anymore. It was rebuilt in 1780. And then there was a fire in 1947. And more was rebuilt again. Yes. Yeah. Guess who is said to haunt the building? The Bonnie Prince himself. But of course he would. <laughs> and let's remember guys. The Bonnie Prince, the young pretender, Charles Edward Stuart, he didn't die at the battle. He fled. He lived for another 42 years following his escape and died of a stroke at the age of 67 on the 30th of January, 1788, in Rome. And the Duke of Cumberland, the bloody butcher, Prince William Augustus, he didn't live as long as his opponent from that day. After suffering from poor health as well as being obese and having a stroke at age 39 from which he never fully recovered from, he died aged 44 on October the 31st, Halloween, in the Mayfair area in London. And that's one of the purple properties in Monopoly. Now I do believe I'm going to call it a day there, guys. I can only hope you've enjoyed this and maybe you've gained some new knowledge from it too. If you ever do get the opportunity to visit the site itself, take a moment to reflect on the world-changing impact that occurred there. 
The outcome of that battle has shaped the world we live in today. If the Jacobites had won, if the Hanovers had lost the throne, no King George III, no madness of King George, no high taxation of the American colonies, no pushback, no revolutionary war, no American independence. Likewise, no tension with France, no war between Britain and France, no strain on the French economy, no peasant pushback, no French revolution. How would the world look? Maybe a British Empire still dominating the globe and the continent of Europe could still be carved into many little kingdoms. And I would like to add, please be assured this episode was about the Battle of Culloden and the potential hauntings. Part of that involved emphasising the terror inflicted. Most of that was done by the Redcoats. So please don't take it as myself being biased to a side. Rest assured, if you like, that the Jacobites were not saints either. If you're sitting there in a rage at the negative portrayal of the Redcoats, I'll balance things a bit by reading a passage that I came across in Hugh Miller's Scenes and Legends of the North of Scotland. And it goes, The marauders, it's the Jacobites, entered the town about midday. They were armed every one after his own fashion, some with dirks and broadswords, some with pistol and fowling pieces, and not a few with scythes, pikes and lochaber axes. He goes on. They entered the better-looking houses by half-dozens, turned the furniture topsy-turvy, emptied chests and drawers, did wonderful execution on dried salmon and hung beef, and set ale barrels brooch. One poor woman, in attempting to rescue a bundle of yarn, had her cheek laid open by a fellow who dashed the muzzle of his pistol into her face. Another was thrown down and robbed of her shoes. So they did do their fair bit of looting and menacing too. If we ever cover the other Jacobite uprisings and battles, I'm sure that will all be covered there. Rascals. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode one of Legends of Lore. If you do visit Culloden Battlefield and see an omen of death, or pass a Highlander mutter defeated to himself, even if you hear something you can't explain, let me know. I'll do a special episode of Listener's Experiences. Regarding that, please just get in touch. Tell me your ghost stories. Share your own brushes with unexplained phenomena or a legendary event you're somehow connected to. Remember, everyone has a ghost story. Or a good tale about something amazing. And if you don't, Maybe it just hasn't happened yet. Okay. <laughs> right, guys. So that was the first episode. Um, fucking a weird reading a script. Maybe yeah. So I won't even won't even try and influence your feedback. If you could please possibly leave any feedback, very much appreciated. But yeah, I just sat down, and tried that all in one go. So now I've got to edit and cut out all my. Weird pauses and the sounds of folks shouting outside, and then there were seagulls at one point and cars. Geez, oh, there's a yep, a few of those. I'm gonna have to edit them out. Okay, guys, so yep, please do get in touch with any feedback, very much appreciated. I hope you're well, and there'll be a uh, normal The Crack Podcast episode coming soon. All right, guys, <laughs> speak to you next time. Bye for now.